So um, welcome everyone. Um, I am Priscilla Abercrombie. I am chair of the board of directors for Pope Northern Sonoma County and the community co-leader for Pope Fitch Mountain. So we are just delighted that you're all here to learn about what all this uh, prescribed burning is all about. And we have a packed agenda. We're gonna start with a historical and cultural perspective on burning with um, Sherry Smith Ferry um, from Dry Creek Ranch, Rancheria. And then we have a scientific perspective from Sasha Burlman. Uh, Dr. Burlman is a fire ecologist. And then we have Craig Tallman um, talking about air quality issues. We, and I know that um, we got a lot of questions uh, ahead of time about the process for planning for a burn. So Chief Turbeville is gonna give us the, the lowdown on that. Um, we have a quick uh, burn video that we're going to show you um, that Eric Dickey did, um, which was posted on Facebook by the Northern Sonoma County uh, Fire Protection District. It's very um, short, I want to say five, seven minutes at the most. It's a great overview um, and a great kind of on the ground um, uh, visual of what that's all about. And then we're really lucky to have Paul Pressler with us, who's a landowner who's gone through um, a few burns and he can talk to you from his perspective of what it's like to be a landowner um, who has done a burn. So um, that's what we have planned. The last, um, I hope around a half an hour, 20 minutes, we will be able to just have question and answers. And um, I just wanna set some ground rules um, around that. If you wouldn't mind, please using, because we're gonna have over hundred uh, people attending this, um, please put all of your questions in the chat. Um, I'm fortunate to have a um, partner in crime um, helping me with that. Um, Pat Abercrombie, my husband, is, is monitoring the chat and we'll do our best to make sure that your questions get answered. Um, so please be sure and mute yourself and uh, use the chat. All right, and moving along here, just wanted to give you a quick overview of COPE. I know a number of you are not um, familiar with COPE from what I gathered from um, the registration. So I just wanted to quickly go through. These are our board of um, directors, gives you an idea of it's, it's very much a collaborative effort between fire agencies and um, local um, folks that are doing COPE in the community as well as uh, county agencies. The mission of COPE is, is to really help residents, families, neighborhoods become and remain better pre prepared and um, able to recover from emergencies. Uh, we started out with three communities in 2017, became a fire safe council in 2019, and now we represent over 40 communities and have um, now our 501c3 just in the last year. So it's been an exciting growth over the last three years. We've been through a lot in the last three years. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's been quite quite the ride here in Northern Sonoma County. So we serve COPE leaders who represent the fourth district. Um, and we really are trying to focus um, more and more on our most vulnerable in our communities, whether they're seniors, folks who may not speak English as a first language, people with um, disabilities, all those kinds of things. And we're really a grassroots community effort. Comes uh, ground up, most of what uh, we do is from the ground up. People telling us what they need and, and us trying to do those things. So we were a partnership, as I said, we convene a leadership group uh, every month. We represent about 25 different agencies now um, in the community. So either fire agencies or, um, uh, the sheriff um, and a number of nonprofits. We oftentimes uh, get together to debrief after fires and and, um, and really give each other input um, about how things went, how we might change things and try to do things better. And then um, finally, we're really about sharing information and education and um, doing projects together. And that's what this last slide is, is about, helping people do their uh, community wildfire 
protection plans, uh, preparing maps, having a communication method. One of the anticipated, unanticipated outcomes of COPE has been that um, people feel better um, prepared because they have a, a communication strategy in their neighborhood. And um, so we've been working very hard on that, making sure that people are in the know when stuff is happening, um, especially as, as we know, there's been a lot going on in Northern um, Sonoma County. We help with reflective house signs. We're talking about those numbers that need to be reflective. 13A requires that all homes have those visible signs, evacuation plans and drills. Uh, we're hoping to do one on in Fitch Mountain this year. Um, it's been delayed a couple times due to fire and COVID. Uh, community chipper days, really trying to promote those more and more in your communities. If you haven't had one of those, let's make it happen. <laughs> We um, have uh, fire awareness signs and vegetation management projects. That's the kind of stuff we do. And I just wanted to um, share that with you. All right, let me stop sharing here. And I will turn it over to Sherry. Well, uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, my name is Sherry Smith Ferry. I'm a member of the Dry Creek Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians, which is in Northern Sonoma County. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna be sharing a little bit of a um, sort of wider and older uh, perspective on fire. And um, like all California Indians, Pomo elders told stories of how fire came into the world. And Pretty much the, the arc of the story is that clever animals are ultimately successful in being able to steal fire from the supernatural being who is hoarding it. However, they're forever marked by their brave efforts. And so the story we tell is Jack Rabbit, who um, was fast, almost got away but uh, suffered severe burns when he was forced to hide the coal that he had stolen by sitting on it so it wouldn't be found. And his tail turns ashy white as a result of that. In all of the stories, fire brings precious light and heat, but it always comes at a cost. It's a valuable gift. It's taught that it has enormous power it's always required sacrifice and it demands respect. In a sense, um, Native peoples, it's, it's kind of like the coming of electricity into the world. Uh, fire is a thing that gives you heat, it gives you light, uh, it helps you make things um, and enables you to, to cook and eat. Um, it is a great gift. And when you talk about um, California and uh, its natural state, uh, it really wasn't very natural. <laughs> so California is best seen for thousands and thousands and thousands of years while native people lived here as being this garden that was managed. It was tended, it wasn't just let wild. So California Indians used an array of sophisticated ecosystem engineering techniques, if you want to throw it into more contemporary verbiage, to manage the natural world around them. These practices enabled the land here in, in Northern California to sustain both an abundance and a variety of plant and animal species at numbers that are virtually unimaginable to us today. So one of the examples of this is the vast fields of wildflowers that once painted the valley floor and the hillsides in the springtime. And fire was really the cornerstone of those land management practices. And we're talking about what we call cultural burning. Um, so deliberate recurring human set fires. It was really the most effective land management tool that we had in our toolbox. So traditional indigenous fire management utilizes low intensity fires that are seasonally timed. 
So generally start at the end of summer and go throughout the fall. And though they're smoky, these kind of fires don't burn hot. They don't have very many flames. Um, they kind of smolder and spread slowly and horizontally along the ground. They're not going up into the trees. They're basically um, being able to help Native peoples, uh, much as agricultural societies use a plow, they help you clear the land. They help you um, put uh, nutrients into the soil. In this case, uh, the ashes of the vegetation that's burned. Um, they help you, um, ironically, um, it sounds contradictory, but they will, if you burn, it helps you um, increase the water that you have because it's decreasing the competition for uh, other plants sort of tapping into that same water table. Um, and it also um, allows plants that need light, um, need open space uh, to grow to, um, you know, sort of have that land cleared away and they're able to come into that. It helps people get rid of a lot of the pests that bother some of the insect pests that really bother uh, some of the different um, plants around here and make them unhealthy because most of those plants uh, kind of are in the debris and in the ground underneath the uh, oak trees, for example, or some of the other uh, kinds of large uh, uh, shrubs and, and bushes um, as well. Uh, because when you're burning under them, you're destroying those pests. So there's all kinds of reasons uh, to burn. Um, it makes the land much um, easier to, you know, you open up the landscape, it makes it much easier to walk through and especially to hunt. Um, and it's not just humans that have an easier time, it's animals that have an easier time after a burn. One of the things that burning does is it causes this kind of flush of nutrients into the system and new growth, um, which is really attractive to all of those animals. So it's really increasing a lot of browse um, for a lot of different kinds of species. So there's just this whole range of really beneficial things that happen with these low intensity burns. And I'm sure Sasha is going to be talking a lot more about that. Um, but you can see why Native peoples are regularly burning. And one of the things, of course, that those burns did was reduce the amount of dead vegetation that was around. Uh, and so one of the things that did help was to prevent against wildfires. But I just want to sort of put the idea out there that um, it's not the only thing uh, that controlled burns do and that it actually is a tool to make the environment around you a much healthier environment. It's really a source of landscape renewal and healing rather than a means of destruction. So it's just trying to help people not be so afraid of fire, um, even though it is, as we know, awfully, <laughs> awfully powerful. Um, it has power for good. So native people used to, in California, used to burn. Um, and just to give you an idea of the extensiveness of the burning, um, kind of using multiple lines of evidence, environmental archaeologists and paleoecologists have determined that approximately 4 to 12 million acres in California burned annually during like about the last 5,000 years here before the arrival of Europeans. And to put that in perspective, Sasha, I'm sure you probably know, but isn't there something like a little over 4 million acres burned this summer um, that we just went through, which was one of the worst on record? I think so. Marshall might actually know the wildfire statistic even better than me too, but yeah. Yeah, that's and correct. Over 4 million acres, the highest ever in, in recorded history. Right, so we're just at the very sort of low end of what used to burn here every summer. Um, but it wasn't, again, as destructive as what we just saw. Um, it's kind of maintenance, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. 
Um, and the newcomers that came into California, the Spanish first, and then all the other peoples that came, were really um, both bewildered and um, uh, frightened uh, by the destructive, you know, the seemingly destructive practice that they saw Native peoples here uh, doing. They could not understand why they were setting fires. Uh, so one of the earliest laws uh, in sort of the first legislative session in the new state of California that was passed um, imposed severe restrictions on uh, severe penalties on any Indians that quote unquote set the prairies on fire. So it was um, wide enough practice throughout California that it was felt that you needed um, quick and extensive <laughs> sort of legal repercussions to stop native people from burning. And what happened in the following two centuries is that this kind of practice of regular burning was suppressed and it caused huge vegetation buildups throughout the state. So I went back to some CDF um, statistics and just averaged them out in terms of the amount of, of fire that was allowed to burn, wildfire that was allowed to burn in the state. And between 1970 and 1980, an average of 20,000 acres burned per year in the state during the summer. So you can see the difference in scale from what was the practice and for thousands of years versus um, kind of what happened more recently. And that is part of the reason, along with climate change, why there is such a problem with wildfires in this state. So basically, I'm just wanting to kind of give that context and advocate that really one of the most effective solutions to the problem is an indigenous, indigenous one. Uh, we need to return to regular widespread low intensity controlled burns um, to help whittle down that fuel load and put good fire back on the ground. We need to move away from waging a war on fire to learning to partner again with fire. And thank you. Thank you, Sherry. That was great. Really appreciate your perspective and want to take the opportunity to acknowledge that we are on Pomo land um, where we are here in Northern Sonoma County and that long history um, is an important part of our history that we need to recognize and acknowledge. So um, thank you for that. All right, um, I believe that Sasha is going to follow you. So let me um, get Sasha on here. All right. I can pull up my screen share too. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, all right. Here we go, and shoot, how do I get the play button? You're good, we've got your um, PowerPoint. Okay, but it, I'm guessing it's not sharing as a full screen presentation? Yeah, just go to the bottom of your PowerPoint and click on the slide. Oh, yep. nice. Yep, there okay. you go. I'm used to using the top corner button. I just learned a new <laughs> way to do that. Yay. Well done. Um, <laughs> can operate Zoom still after a year of being on it all the time. Um, all right, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, Sherry, it is such an honor to get to present after you and I'm absolutely um, thrilled right now. So that's really exciting. Um, it's, yeah, I'm, it's great to not be trying to tell that whole story as a precursor to what I can um, present on. So thank you for sharing. I did um, include this map of um, tribes in the Bay Area prior to European um, colonization of this region. Um, and I just love sharing this to set a context. And I think it builds well off of everything that Sherry just shared, because it just shows how densely and diversely populated the Bay Area was before Europeans arrived. Um, for thousands of years with, with all of these diverse tribes and languages um, around the greater Bay Area. Um, this is a, a really popular place to be for many of the same reasons that we all love being in the Bay Area today. Um, it's full of 
diverse resources and wonderful weather. It's it's a great place to be. Um, and uh, this is a really important part of the story that I like to share with people. Um, if you can't see the numbers on the right hand side, please do move the, the video box. Um, so uh, in California or in ecosystems in fire science, we use what's called a, a fire regime. So it's the um, it's the different aspects of fire type that each community is adapted to um, and the, the type of fire that they like to have. And that includes seasonality and intensity and severity, um, but it also includes frequency of fire. So how often fire is expected to burn um, or is naturally adapted to burn in each of those ecosystems. And this is a, a chart that I've made compiling many, many, many scientific studies um, trying to put together the frequency of fire um, that fire is supposed to be burning in each of these ecosystems that we have in the North Bay area. Um, median is median fire return interval and then high is the, the longest end. So we're saying that in any managed woodland, oak woodland, we're looking at a median fire return interval of about two years. Um, and that maximum is going up to eight to 11 years where they're less actively tended. Um, when we get down to redwoods, I, I have in here a 10 year median fire return interval. Um, but when you look at studies from even Marin County and redwoods, those redwoods were experiencing a fire return interval every four years. Um, so even more frequent fire than 10. Um, so this just really helps encapsulate how frequently these ecosystems that we have here in the Bay Area are adapted to burn. Um, and pretty quickly, you can see that these ecosystems that we love and cherish right here in the North Bay Area are adapted to much more frequent fire than many of them have seen over the last couple of hundred years while we've suppressed fire from happening. Um, and I also really like this quote that I have on the far left here um, from Keeley and then Stevens and Libby saying, um, impacts of Native American burning were highest near larger population centers in coastal California and the Central Valley where lightning emissions were rare. Um, and so we, we didn't need lightning fire to be uh, burning these landscapes. People were doing an incredible job using fire to actively tend these ecosystems um, and manage them for all of those incredible values that Sherry shared before. Um, all of that active tending for thousands of years leads to um, ecosystems that are really co-evolved with people in a really deep and meaningful way. And they've all adapted um, traits that allow them to thrive with fire in their correct frequency and intensity and severity. And so we have resistors like um, some pines and, and even a couple oaks that have nice thick or repellent bark that keeps the heat off of the cambium and off of the tree. Um, we have sprouters like redwoods that throw up tons of new shoots, um, as well as many of our chaparral system plants. We have cedars or what we call obligate cedars that will not germinate unless they experience fire. Um, that includes many very incredible rare wildflowers and chaparral um, that absolutely need fire to come through and they'll stay dormant in the, in the soil for a hundred years waiting for fire to come through and then they'll all pop up. That goes for some of our chaparral shrub species as well. Um, we have some invaders, and that's not just um, a non-native invasive species, but um, some just annual wildflowers that really thrive in a wild in a, in a fire situation and come up afterwards. And then we have um, avoiders. So uh, those are species like the, the few that might be found in marshes or maybe right in the middle of a riparian area that are actually adapted to avoid fire most of the time in most ways. Um, so we use fire for many reasons modern in modern times as well as historically these these overlap because we can't extricate ourselves from the reality that these ecosystems that we cherish evolved with people and co-evolved in that way. Um, and one of the most important in my perspective in that way is our oak woodlands. So an issue that we're dealing with um, in many parts of the North Bay area and all the way up the North Coast and some parts of the Central Coast as well um, are, are oak woodlands because they're adapted to frequent 
low intensity fire and people using fire to steward them are getting overtopped by Douglas fir in many cases and in other cases by bay laurel um, or even sometimes madrone where um, these, these trees that are not as adapted to frequent fire in the absence of fire in oak woodlands are taking over and we've seen many oak woodlands across the North Bay area um, and across the state being completely converted and lost to these other species that really um, just take over in a, in a pretty out of control way when fire is removed from those landscapes. So we use fire to restore and maintain oak woodlands and um, it's definitely easier to do this if you catch it before a wildfire goes through. Um, because once a wildfire goes through an oak woodland that's already gone through this conversion, um, something that we see often is that that wildfire burns at a higher intensity than or, or a higher severity than that ecosystem that woodland is adapted to have, and you get some adverse effects from that experience. Um, so sometimes that requires some mechanical thinning as well, but um, pile burning, or even in some cases, if you catch early enough, um, broadcast burning works. Um, we also burn in oak woodlands for acorn protection. Sherry mentioned this. We have some native pests, um, including the acorn weevil, which is a pretty cute little pest, but um, acorn weevils and acorn moths can decimate acorn populations and in every single year of the acorn crop, um, including mast year. So we use fire to mitigate those pests, which um, exist in the leaf litter underneath the trees. So if we burn in the fall or early winter, we can actually reduce those populations of acorn pests and help support acorn populations, which can become new oak trees, um, as well as a massive food source for wildlife and people alike. Uh, also another system that's really um, had a hard time ever since fire suppression became the norm has been coastal prairie. Um, it's also at risk due to development by people as oak woodlands have been. Um, and so this is just an, an example where we, we had 292 acres of coastal prairie grasslands um, in the Marin Coast at, at this one project site. Um, and just as of a couple of years ago, we had down to three acres of coastal prairie in that same footprint due to encroachment by coyote brush and Douglas fir. So we can use fire to maintain and restore grasslands, particularly coastal prairie, um, where they're getting encroached by the absence of fire by uh, coyote brush and Douglas fir trees. Um, coastal prairie is another one of those ones that's adapted to very frequent fire. And so you have to be providing that frequent disturbance in order to maintain that system at all and let alone see it thrive. These days we also use prescribed fire for managing lots of invasive weeds with different levels of success and different levels of needing to pair that treatment with other treatments as well. Um, everything from Medusa head where one burn can get you to 99.6% control of that invasive weed um, down to parting grass where um, you can do a prescribed burn, you're going to knock it back to the ground and then it's going to re-sprout and you're going to have to do something about that re-sprout. Um, so each of these invasive weeds takes a different type of treatment using fire, but fire can help the situation in all of these cases when applied correctly. And then we also burn for just non-native annual grass thatch removal. Um, all of California's dominant native bunch or native grasses are bunch grasses and they're perennial so they're very long lived and they grow in bunches so those those that kind of classic golden hills that you're used to seeing in California is actually the non native annual grasses that have naturalized um, in the last couple of hundred years and as they have naturalized out here they've created a thatchy layer that can completely outcompete the native wildflowers that we would typically see. Um, so burning in the fall just to remove the thatch of those annual grasses can really improve wildflower populations as well. So lots of reasons we burn um, and there are new ways and um, new like ways in which progress is being made all of the time in this in entire effort. 
in the prescribed burn work. So um, I quickly wanted to touch on, um, I'm the director of Fire Forward at Audubon Canyon Ranch. We're a capacity building program and community building program, um, really focused on improving our ability to use prescribed fire in the Bay Area um, by developing an equipment cache and doing some community organizing, offering trainings, um, and uh, getting people together toward this goal. Um, the Good Fire Alliance is the, is the Sonoma County slash kind of uh, other neighboring counties prescribed burn association. And it's the same kind of idea as COPE in that it's a neighbors helping neighbors, grassroots community effort to, to work together to get more good fire on the ground. Um, anyone can join. It's really intended to, to bring together people who are action oriented and are gonna get out on the ground and help each other get work done. Um, and the idea is that if you are getting involved and in supporting other people's projects and going to community work days, um, building fire line, thinning out the understory, doing burn unit prep or doing those prescribed burns, um, then the, the community could potentially come to your property and, and support you the same way. So um, as soon as I stop sharing the screen, I'll share a link for how you can subscribe to the Good Fire Alliance listserv and join that community. Um, and then I'll also share a landowner intake form that we've developed um, through which you can submit to have a site visit um, happen on your property where someone can walk and talk with you about prescriber and opportunities there may be. Um, we do ask that you don't fill out the landowner intake survey unless you're really interested in getting a prescribed burn to happen because a site visit takes a lot of time and effort and energy. Um, and if, if, you, if it's not really a good um, fit in the first place, that, that can be pretty tough. So I'm going to share both um, and we'd love to be in touch. And I'm happy to answer any questions around any of this in the question and answer comment period. Thank you, Sasha. Wow, great, great background. I'm so lucky to have your expertise. Um, and you and Sherry just piggybacked so well on each other. That was great. I'm going to switch to Craig now. Um, he's our air quality person. And um, he, I believe, uh, Craig, you're going to share your screen. Um, you know, I think I'll just uh, speak, Priscilla. Um, I don't. I don't have slides to share. If if there are some okay. specific, if there are specific questions around um, how to get a permit, things like that, I can. There's some things I can share, but um, I think I'll just talk if that's okay. Of course. All right. Um, well, um, thanks for to everyone for being here. Um, my time's a little bit limited, so I'll keep my uh, my points pretty brief. But um, you know. For the most part, I'm really just here to answer questions and make sure that people are uh, feel comfortable um, asking questions around air quality issues and uh, maybe just give a basic framework for you know why we do air quality work at all with this um, kind of work and these projects. Um, so uh, if anyone does have questions about anything related to air quality, now would be a good time to just throw it in the chat and I'll try and uh, answer those questions directly. Um, so I'll keep an eye on. Uh, the chat bar as I'm speaking. Um, but, uh, you know, the reason I'm here is just to talk about how prescribed fire interacts and affects air quality. Um, and just to encourage people to reach out to me directly um, with any questions after this talk is done. Um, it's really important to me that air quality issues not become an obstacle to using prescribed fire. Uh, it's very important work. Um, there are some necessary um, regulations and permit requirements for doing it. Um, but it's my personal goal um, to not uh, let that become an obstacle to any of these projects going forward. So um, I've been working in air quality for you know, several years now and have had an opportunity to see a lot of the different ways that fire is used to manage land. Um, our agency issues about 4,000 burn permits a year in Northern Sonoma County. Um, but only a small fraction of those are, are prescribed fire permits. Um, for the most part, close to 99% of those permits are just for the kind of more traditional pile burn type uh, activities that you've probably seen in the area. Um, but, you know, in doing that work, it's, I've had a lot of um, uh, good opportunities just to speak with landowners and uh, get a lot of different perspectives on how fire um, inter affects air quality. Um, 
and recently the wildfires have really forced some kind of fundamental shifts in how both I think about air quality and I think a lot of people in this field do. Um, you know, traditionally, you know, fire has just sort of been viewed strictly as a source of air pollution and nothing else. And that as a source of air pollution, it needs to be contained and, and controlled. Um, you know, our, our perspective is changing though, because we're, we're kind of seeing that there's a certain inevitability to this fire um, and we can't suppress it forever and we certainly can't control it. Um, so, you know, as we're changing our perspective, I think the, the new thinking is sort of becoming not that fire is strictly a source of air pollution, but it's also a method for controlling air pollution. Um, and, you know, it, it can be feel very paradoxical at times. Um, but the fact is that, you know, there's uh, a lot of different kinds of fire and we do have some control over what types of fire we use to uh, manage our land. Um, and as you know, research is showing, and as I've seen personally from uh, you know the work that I've done, you know the the good use of fire um, can be a really powerful tool for minimizing or um, even eliminating air pollution uh, when used properly. So, um, you know, with that uh, you know with that in mind, we're really just trying to push for more prescribed burning to be done generally. Um, it's a it's a great tool for uh, you know minimizing the um, the air quality impacts from wildfire. There is going to be an inevitable air quality impact, um, and my work is mostly going to be focused on trying to minimize that impact when uh, prescribed fire is used. But um, we, like I said, it's just it's very important to me that that work not become an obstacle to the the projects going forward. So um, you know if anyone has questions about how that process works, um, you know, I'm happy to speak more, but, um, you know, generally the, the basic outline that anyone interested in doing a, a prescribed fire would want to understand is that there generally is going to need to be um, some amount of planning that goes into um, uh, evaluating the smoke that's going to be created, um, seeing who's, who it's going to impact and what steps we can take to minimize it. Um, once that work's been done, we issue a permit and, uh, after you know consulting with fire officials and um, neighbors, uh, these projects are going forward for the most part without too many too many hitches or um, or complaints from you know the neighboring communities. So um, I think I'll I'll leave it there uh, for now unless there's any other questions. Um, but you know there's the other guests have, are given a lot of good um, reasons for to use prescribed fire, and I think that. Uh, improving air quality is is another one that we that we should all keep in mind. So um, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, Craig, there's one question in the chat um, that says, "What jurisdiction level are permits issued at?" Okay, um, so there's a couple layers to permitting uh, fires. Marshall can speak and probably will speak to a lot of this when he when he talks about the planning issues. So, um, and he can check me if, if I say anything wrong here, but um, during all times of the year, if you want to do a uh, controlled burn of any kind um, in our jurisdiction, and that's the, the Northern Sonoma County Air Pollution District, an air quality permit is going to be required. During fire season, um, in areas where uh, this, there is a state responsibility for the land, so that's CAL FIRE jurisdiction. CAL FIRE will also require a permit during fire season. Um, if it's a non-CAL uh, FIRE jurisdiction, the local fire agency may require a permit, but does not always. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, basically, you always need an air quality permit, and you sometimes need a fire safety permit. Um, we are a, a local Juris, we're a local agency that, um, with uh, uh, local leadership, and um, you know our our offices in Hillsburg. So, um, you know that's uh, the level of jurisdiction that we issue the permits at. So, hopefully, that answers the the question. There was another follow-on about um, how much lead times required to process permits. Um, that's going to depend on the project, but um, if you're getting a, a, a like a simple open burning permit for a burn pile that can be issued in one to two days. Um, there are um, prescribed fire permits that can be issued for small projects that don't require smoke planning. Once again, um, generally those can be issued in 
a matter of days, probably maybe it really just is a matter of just getting in touch with me so I can give my cell phone or email uh, contact information to anybody who wants it. But, um, you know, uh, where appropriate, those permits can be issued in, in a few days. And then for prescribed fire projects that do require planning for the smoke impacts, um, that's really going to depend on how fast the the landowner can move in developing that plan. But um, I've seen, you know, people who are familiar with the process do it in, in a day. Um, I can I can issue these things very quickly if they need to be because I don't want it to be an obstacle to the the project going forward. But I would I would tell anyone that's planning to do a, a prescribed fire that probably give it a couple of weeks um, uh, for the planning purposes um, and uh, you know just give some time for any contingencies that may come up. But anyway, hopefully that uh, that's a pretty good estimate of how fast we can issue these permits. Great, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I know you need to run. So um, I also have your, if you could put any, you know, contact info you feel comfortable with in the chat, that would be great. Otherwise I can pass things along as well. Thank you, Craig. Really appreciate your input. Thank you, Priscilla. Yeah. All right, so we will um, switch gears and, um, Chief Turbeville is going to talk about the process for planning for a burn. So he'll cover some of the material that Craig um, talked about um, and more. Well, when you hype it up like that, I, I got, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to talk just uh, what I call the three hurdles. Um, when I ask people, you know, why? why aren't they burning? These are kind of some, how they circle around three different main issues. So I'll talk about the three hurdles and I'll go into the planning process and um, I can, uh, you know, talk about air quality and the burn permit process too. So um, the three hurdles, and this is for the, for the people listening in, this is something that is probably holding you back. I mean, everyone I think on this call um, understands fire use or the benefits of burning. So this is kind of like, why aren't we doing more burning? And it comes down to what I see environmental review um, and I'll talk about environmental review, but that mainly is associated with the governmental entities that that are asked or, or, or leading the burning um, resources and funding. Um, not that it costs a, a lot of money or takes a lot of people, but just having those trained qualified and, and, and pieces in place. And the last it's, it's a big one and I'm um, going to ask uh, Sasha to comment as well is just liability and there hopefully is some good news with that, but there is some workarounds as well. So with all these hurdles just like in real life hurdles are all of different length and height and, and unique to each of us. Um, there is some workarounds and hopefully there's some good stuff coming forward in the future as well to allow more, more fire use. So for the environmental review where, where this becomes a hurdle is when you wanna partner with a government entity or have received grant funding um, from a government entity that then requires you to do an environmental review. And, and most of the time with California state funding, it's the California, California Environmental Quality Act. So for government, whether it be a local fire district, like I've been involved with prescribed burning or CAL FIRE, um, there is a level of environmental review that's gotta take place. And so it, it can be somewhat elaborate or it can be somewhat simple. Um, my opinion is, is if we're going to need to do a full blown or the, the most ex extravagant document called an environmental impact report, we probably are not going to be able to prescribe burn. It's just going to be too tall of a hurdle, definitely possible, but probably too tall of a hurdle to get over. So that's the environmental review. I'm going to show you a workaround for that here in a little bit as well. Um, here's the liability. And I've noticed this isn't in the same order I listed on that one slide, but the next is the liability. And so that is, I would say, the highest hurdle for the private landowner to want to go burn their own property. They it could burn under their neighbor's property. It could burn the base of a tree that later then falls on a neighbor's house. Um, and it's just that unknown and uh, un, you know kind of an uneasy feeling that you're responsible if something bad happens from trying to do something good. And uh, even for fire agencies, that's an issue too. And I think there was a comment about escaped. Uh, prescribed burns. And you notice I'm using the word prescribed burn, not control burns. That's just a, how I phrase it, because yes, there has been escaped control burns or escape prescribed burns. It's it's nature. There's always that possibility. And so to me, liability is taking that possibility down to as close as zero as we can get it, knowing that we can never get it to a 0% chance of escaping. 
I mean, there's just fluke things that could happen, like a root burns underneath the dozer line or a, a bird picks up a burning twig or a, a stump rolls out at two o'clock in the morning when no one's monitor fire, just things like that can happen or uh, unpredicted wind events. So we do everything we can to get that liability as close as we can to 0%, but there's always a small percentage. And so liability could be a big hurdle and we may want really wide boundary or control lines. We may want not be able to burn right up against homes and that was some of the questions I saw that submitted prior to the to presentation, but that we just got to manage our liability. Or we may not be able to burn 20 acres, we only burn two acres. And I'm going to say, even at that scale, two acres, I, I think that's still a good legitimate prescribed burn. So that's a liability. And there is some uh, hopefully good news coming there forward with California laws and stuff, liability moving forward. And then the last piece is the resources and funding. Um, that's where it is beneficial to partner with government entities, firefighter agencies, specifically the prescribed burn associations. You heard about Audubon and Kenyon Ranch and Fire Forward Initiative um, because they have the resources. You need you know, someone that can kind of guide 20 people um, with where to light the fire or how we're gonna light it or just to be safe on the fire line. Um, some of this stuff is not that, um, though it may uh, appear to be really complex, really technical, it's, it's not that complex, not that technical, when you see how fire burns and how you can ignite fire or use slope or wind or different features that are out there in the natural environment to our advantage when you want to try to manage or do prescribed burning. So that's the resources and funding. Um, this could get somewhat a little more uh, tricky is when we talk about obtaining permits. So as Craig said, year round, you need an air quality permit regardless of air quality jurisdiction, whether you're Bay Area, Northern Sonoma County, Lake or Mendocino or, or going farther south. Um, if you do need to get a fire department permit, so I call the air quality permit an air quality permit, even though it may also be called the burn permit, but burn permit in my mind is what the fire department gives you. And whether that's Cal Fire or the local agency, you need to see what type of uh, sideboards or parameters are gonna put on, on your burn. And so they may ask for two fire engines or two trucks with X amount of gallons with a pump or, or 10 firefighters with hand tools. They may put some boundaries or conditions on your burn permit and that's where that resource or funding uh, hurdle you know it could become an issue you could maybe pay your local fire department to help staff your burn but that might trigger then the environmental review you could hire an outside consultant maybe like firestorm or other entities that do have fire trucks that are non-government fire trucks uh, to help staff your burn or some type of consultant so there's workarounds for these hurdles but ultimately in, in this situation here, it comes down to what's your available resources and what's your funding. So these three hurdles, that's why I've drawn the circles here, they do interact with one another as well. So then if we take those hurdles and now put it into like a process, uh, I would say before you look at the hurdles is, you know, what are you trying to achieve? And, and Sasha gave great examples. And I saw some questions in the chat. What, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to just reduce um, the vegetation to remove the ladder fuels? Are we trying to um, do something for ecological reasons like push back the trees encroaching upon our prairie? What are we looking to do? What are your desired future conditions? Um, and, and right now we have a tremendous diversity across our landscape. We have areas that burned just last year that have a lot of dead understory. We have areas that have not burned in, I don't want to say 100 plus years, but a, a long period of time. And so you know, what are you trying to do? I'm, I'm gonna say that if you think that, I mean, it depends how you visualize fire, but if you think that we're just gonna light a hillside on fire and all the dead understory is just gonna disappear, um, that may not be the case. There's variables that go into that, such as how wet the vegetation is, time of year, burn intensity and things of that nature. So is it really gonna meet the objectives you want? And, and perhaps you gotta do something, a pre-entry method or prep, prep the burn unit. So. That's number one is, is look at it like, what are you trying to achieve? Then look at those three hurdles. Um, talk with your neighbors. Does your homeowner's insurance maybe um, allow you to do burning and, and assume that liability? Um, is the Good Fire Alliance available to maybe provide resources to staff? Maybe your local fire department. And then I don't have it spelled out specifically in this slide, but you know, Cal, Cal Fire, the Vegetation Management Program or the Vegetation Treatment Program, is there other opportunities, um, though they may be more complex and take a lot more planning, um, are there out there to kind of mitigate or, or navigate your way through these hurdles? Maybe it's just not your property. Maybe you can stitch together your neighbor's property and then make it a larger scale project or to take it to, I'm gonna say a line of convenience, like an already a road that's already there or a ridge top or a creek. And you're gonna need your neighbor's um, cooperation at some point anyway. So ideally, 
Um, so maybe that's just a conversation you can have someone in the beginning to determine the scale and, and how this is all going to be laid out. So once you get through those three hurdles, to me, the next big question, and this drives kind of everything from, from here forward, is, is this going to be a government managed, you know, Cal Fire, local fire district, some entity, a government that's going to be subject to environmental and, and internal processes, or is this going to be the private landowner? So we got kind of two ends of the spectrum. In Sonoma County, a couple of weeks ago, there's a, you know, I'm going to say a tremendous amount of smoke in the West County. That was a complete private landowner burn, uh, burning standing brush and and uh, bulldozed vegetation left over from the Wallbridge fire. It looked scary, a lot of smoke. I, I don't have photos to put in this PowerPoint, but it burned very well for January. That was done without any type of government involvement. Yes, air quality permit, but no need for a burn permit. It wasn't May 1st till the end of fire season. So right now, you know, you could, in theory, within a couple of weeks, implement a prescribed burn if you'd like to on the very private landowner. We're going to have to go through some of this process, but private landowner. Government, not not so quickly. Um, it's the minimum of a month, and minimum and month is about maybe even a record for to process it through. So you got to make that decision. How is this going to be done? Looking at those hurdles and looking at what available resources you have. If you have a prescribed burn association, maybe your local fire district has some opportunities for you. So, so look at that. Um, then there is the burn permit and the air quality permit. And I talked about that a little bit and Craig talked about that. So just see how it's mainly going to be how willing is your air, air jurisdiction or are they going to work with you? Or is it a, next to a school or next to a smoke sensitive area? Maybe you can't do 10 acres, but you can do a quarter acre at a time, something like that. What what are the sideboards or the constraints the fire agency is going to put on it for a fire fire department or a fire burn permit? You know, if you're burning inside the city, the city department might not maybe prohibits it or maybe won't allow it to happen or maybe it's going to put, they got to be on standby and you got to pay them to be on standby. So look at what that's going to, um, entail, maybe that's a cost and economic resources availability type thing. Um, you're going to want to address liability. And the reason I'm putting these, these hurdles up front and all this stuff up front is it, it's, I don't want to say it's a waste of time, but this is, this is basically the feasibility. If you can't get through these, through this process, it's no sense going much farther. So talk about liability and there's prescribed burn or a, a private burn boss consultant type position. And I'll talk about in the scenario coming up. So there's workarounds, but figure out how, how you're going to address all this so everyone's going to be happy. Is your neighbor maybe doesn't, you know, doesn't doesn't want to be part of the plan, but if it, the burns aren't the proper, they don't they don't care. You know, maybe that's another arrangement. So how you're going to deal with that and how it's going to need to be written or structured or signed agreements or contracts just to have that in place. So then we move on to the, you know, some of the stuff can happen simultaneously, but how, what's the scale, um, how, what's the size? Are we gonna have the, the total area to be burned divided up into smaller areas? Are there existing breaks or lines of convenience like those roads? Does the landowner need to put a hand line in? Do we need, I don't wanna say dozer line, but is there existing dozer line we can take advantage of? I just kind of cringe there a little bit because of the environmental review if it's government with soil disturbance but some of the stuff that needs to be thought about. Do we, do we mitigate or reduce some of the liability by limiting the trees up along the, um, along the hand line, along the road? And that's some of that prep boundary that you see a couple bullet points or the next bullet point. Do we do, we do those things to you know, reduce the fire intensity right on the edge of the burn plot or right up against the homes? Do we pull back the duff from the trees so the trees don't burn? Uh, do we uh, protect fence posts? Are there PG&E power lines? So looking at all that type of stuff, and what do we need to do beforehand to implement so that we can get as close as we can to implementing when we get the, the perfect burn day and everything else is in play. So that's that boundary and, and any type of pretreatment. You're then going to want to get a commitment of resources, whether that's just your, your neighbors that are going to help you, neighbor helping neighbor, prescribed burn association model, or a fire department model, or a fire department's going to help. Um, I say tentative dates, you can set dates, but they're really not locked in until almost the day before the morning of um, some of that, some of the air quality, not having, you know, seven to 14 day, um, you know, long term weather predictions, but then also looking at what's the weather going to be seven and 14 days after, after we burn, you know, no predicted red flags, no strong winds, um, maybe we get some moderating or, or rainfall. So a lot of the stuff we're not going to know with precision about when we're going to start a burn. And even when we light that burn, and if it doesn't burn how we want it to burn, we could call it off right then and there. So a lot of the stuff is, is I, I say tentative, it's like a 70% go, a 50% go, or like a 95% go, let's go out there. But ultimately we can call it off if it just doesn't you know, a, a, a weird feel or just some unknown and, we, and everyone's gotta be comfortable with it. We could call it off last minute and actually put the fire prescribed burn out if it's not burning how we want. So 
that's set in the dates. Here's the actual show up. Let's start implementing it. So we have a burn plan, um, kind of like a recipe or a general contractor of how we're going to, where we're going to light first, what, what, we're, what we're trying to achieve. Is there areas we need to make sure we, we take it very slow or the areas we can go fast? What's the fire behavior like? What's our modeling? Um, some of the fancy terms like head fire, backing fire, what, what are our, what flame lengths are we trying to achieve? Um, and then it's, you know, it, it's putting all that stuff together and giving a good briefing in the morning because once you start lighting stuff on fire, it's, it, we're, we're going, um, unless we're gonna put it out right away. Once it, the cat's out of the bag, the cat's out of the bag. So we've got to make sure everyone knows their position, their place, how to communicate. Um, if it does get, you know, I don't want to say out of control, but maybe it, it crosses our line, a leaf lands across the line and burns a, a two foot by two foot area. Is that a big deal or not a big deal? With the back pump, you take care of it, or is that, a, is that an escape? So just those things to kind of consider how we're going to phrase, how we're going to talk on the radio. Obviously, those other bullet points there, like getting the word out, um, who's going to stay on the fire during the night to watch it? Is the landowner going to take care of it? You know, day three, day four, or so some point we're going to start putting the fire out. Or do we put the fire out within 15 minutes after burning because we don't want it to get deep seated in the ground or burn roots. So all that type of stuff um, after the fact, it takes time or after the ignition of how this is going to play itself out. So that's the actual implementation. So I'm just going to run it over on time. I'm just going to give you a couple of scenarios. Uh, the one that I'll present first is the private landowner scenario. Um, unless there's government funding or something required need to do environmental review, there's no need to do environmental review, at least my understanding. Now, I am no way advocating to damage the environment or, or um, you know, cause excess destruction. Uh, there is going to be soil disturbances from people walking and vehicles on roads. And once you do burn, you're taking away the leaf litter. So yeah, rainfall. There's going to be, you know, I, it's whether it just ex, ex, um, needs to be mitigated or not. But there's no requirement, my understanding, on private property for a landowner to do their own burning. So that's what was happening in West Sonoma County a couple of weeks ago. Um, However, you may not have the resources and probably I'm going to say liability is maybe you're probably your, your biggest hurdle in this scenario or you're burning amongst homes. So the, the workarounds there is you can hire a burn boss. Um, the cost is, uh, um, my understanding, a couple thousand dollars that may, there's maybe, a, you know, the perfect burn day, seven people are trying to burn. So there might not be the availability of, of, of burn bosses to help staff your fire. But that is my understanding the workaround. I have not personally been involved in one of these. I know Sasha can comment. And then for resources, maybe you look to a prescribed burn association or, you know, your neighbor helping, maybe you cost share where you patrol the fire that night, the next day, um, maybe you supply water, whatever it might be. So that's the private landowner scenario, which in my opinion going forward, I think, you know, all, all these small acres that people burn added together probably at some point will exceed what government is burning on a prescribed burn. I think that's the trend, which I'm, I'm not opposed to by any means. Um, there's the CAL FIRE scenario where CAL FIRE has programs, uh, structured programs to do the environmental review, to staff the fire, assume all liability, and this might be a better fit for the burn that's, uh, you know, in the wild and urban interface, where there's homes, where there's liability, um, where government needs to take a lead, mainly for the liability and resource availability, and, and then that also the environmental review, uh, more thorough and robust environmental review is then triggered. So that's the CAL FIRE scenario. And then the last one I'll present that we've done is the fire district here in Northern Sonoma County is working within these hurdles, done the environmental review, um, notice of exemption. So not, not trying to take on projects that have, you know, trying to mitigate all the, the bad environmental damage we can do um, or avoiding projects that can cause significant environmental damage. And finally, a notice of exemption. So working around homes and along roads that are existing uh, partnering with other agencies and Sasha being a great partner in that photo I showed in the opening slide was her crew, um, you know, to, to do cost effective, provide training, provide opportunities um, to build capacity um, to implement prescribed burning with willing property owners and the fire district assume the liability um, for those burns. So me personally taking a liability or the fire district or represent taking a liability, we got to make sure we do our best to mitigate that liability. And so that's why, you know, we might be excluding some projects from the liability piece, or we can only carry out so many at a certain time because we only get a window of opportunity like we had from mid November to December last year, where we did, you know, six burns, a little under 200 acres, but it was just going and going and going to take advantage of perfect weather conditions. So, um, Hopefully I've answered more questions that I've created um, and that's the end of my presentation. So turn it back to you, Priscilla. I'm gonna stop. Great, share. thank you, appreciate it. 
All right, there are some questions in the chat. Um, maybe you and Sasha can give those a gander. Um, I want to turn it over to our um, private landowner, to Paul, to um, talk about his experience. Um, let me find you here, Paul. <sighs> How's everybody doing? You okay out there? I'm ready, Priscilla. You good? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for talking. That helps. Yeah. Um, um, why don't you go ahead and get started, and I'll find you and pin you when I find you. Okay. Great. Um, well, thanks everybody for your time today. Um, you know, I think Sasha and, and Marshall covered a lot of the what and how. So um, what I'll do is just try to give you through a homeowner's lens, what did it take uh, to get our homeowners in our community uh, to uh, say yes. I will quickly start by saying when uh, Marshall first uh, introduced the idea that we were going to intentionally light a fire across many acres, right up against our house after four years of wildfires and three evacuations. Um, it seemed a little silly. Um, and then I'll fast forward to the third burn that we did up here when I turned to Marshall and asked him, how do we get the fire to burn hotter? Um, so lots of lessons learned along the way. So I'll, I'll just quickly go through a few things. There are, I kind of think about four areas of responsibility for the homeowners. And I broke them down as build a strategic plan uh, with an expert. In our case, it was both Marshall and the, had the fortune of having Sasha as well. Um, the second is neighbor owner education and communication, um, probably the most important part. And then pre-burn activities and post-burn activities. So let me kind of run through each you know, quickly. Um, we got started, Fred Peterson, uh, who I think is on the call as well, and myself decided that we would start the initiative on behalf of the neighborhood. Um, so to do that, we met with Marshall. We talked about the proposed burn area, uh, what's made strategic sense. So if you've got a, um, if you're a single homeowner and you want to burn on your land, um, it's a little bit easier because you're not coordinating amongst many people. Uh, but I would say to take a step back and strategically look at the community that you live in to see if there's an opportunity to do something that's bigger um, and has more impact uh, is really important. So in our case, um, we met with Marshall, we went through what the possible area was, and we went through all the things we, that he talked about already, including what's the cost, what's the liability, indemnification, you know, how do you, who does it, uh, what's the responsibilities pre and post, um, and how are we gonna resource all of the activities um, in our case, we initially, we planned to burn a span of about 40 acres that went across six different property owners uh, with several homes that were going to be in the expected path of the smoke. Um, so Marshall did an incredible job uh, of really building that plan, uh, including the boundaries, the control lines, you know, how the water resources would work, what the resource requirements were going to be. And in our case, uh, Marshall broke that 40 acres into four units um, so that we would have uh, several manageable burns along the way. So that was a, you know, the first step. The second step um, was to really educate and communicate to all of our neighbors. And we started with Fred and I started and Marshall with the six property owners uh, in the burn zone. And we went through the same thing again, which was um, answering questions, as you can imagine, everyone had tons of issues about liability and responsibility uh, and so on and so forth. But Marshall did a incredible job of giving us all tutorials, setting expectation requirements, answering questions. Um, my job after then was um, to get people to say yes. Um, in our case, uh, there were a little bit more back and forth and more questions that needed to be answered. And uh, Marshall was there to do that or others. Uh, we ultimately had all but one property owner uh, decide to participate. Uh, that other property owner was in the process of selling their land, so it was complicated. So we had to make sure that the plan was going to work uh, without them. 
And, and here's probably the most important thing is we all agreed as landowners that Fred uh, Peterson, myself would take a leadership role. Um, it becomes really important throughout the process, day of the burn, there's gonna be a ton of questions. There's a ton of people that need to interface. And I would highly recommend that if you can uh, get at least one or two people to take that leadership role to streamline the communication uh, across the board, it's really uh, important. Um, we also uh, agreed at that time that I, I would act as treasurer. Uh, there's two kinds of costs. Um, there's what I call shared cost. Uh, those are things like the burn permit that Craig described. It was $250. Um, there's some other, you know, minor costs. It's everything from occasional uh, feeding our fi firefighters and volunteers uh, to some small things. And then there are costs associated uh, with clearing and prepping the land for the burn. And we all agreed that each of the owners would take on the cost responsibility for what was needed on their land. Uh, so we decided not to share that cost per se but that would each would take on that uh, responsibility. Um, and we also, uh, as that process, Marshall really educated us and then Sasha uh, and her team about what's required um, and what do we need to do to make that happen. So that was uh, the next step. Then the, the, the next piece of communication was really to educate uh, the broader neighborhood because even though we weren't burning their land, uh, needless to say, someone's gonna see fire, someone's gonna see smoke, there's gonna be a lot of concern. And we felt it was really important uh, to bring people along and to educate because we expected that there might be an opportunity to go well beyond the 40 acres. Um, we were fortunate, uh, we had an opportunity to invite some about 20 of our neighbors to come meet with Sasha uh, for a lunch. And she did an amazing job just again, going through educating uh, frankly, answering a lot of questions and, and calming a lot of nerves and turning people into from being nervous into evangelists, right? And um, how do we make this happen? What do we have to do? Um, so it was really great uh, in making that happen. Um, and I would say then as part of this, there's communication throughout the process and it's really critical. Um, the, in advance of the burn, when is it going to happen? Um, whether the road is going to be closed, what's the expectation on traffics and smoke. And um, Marshall was great. He allowed us to invite uh, not only the owners, but others in the neighborhood to participate in the uh, fire prep meeting. So people really felt the sense of engagement and ownership and frankly took a, both a lot of the fear away um, of what we needed to do. Marshall, uh, as part of his plan, went out and communicated to uh, many of the COPE members on the call today and other firehouses. And we even alerted the local press um, so that they knew what was going on. So I, I can't stress enough the importance of having communication and having a point person who's going to either do the communication or orchestrate the communication, you know, throughout the process. Um, so then I'll quickly jump to the kind of pre-burn activities and the post-burn activities. On the pre-burn, as part of the plan that Marshall had put together for us, um, we knew where we needed to put uh, these control lines. Uh, we were super fortunate. Uh, I think Eric Dickey is on the call as well. And he really pitched in and helped us. In a couple of cases, we put in a dozer line. Um, and in other cases, Sasha's team uh, had a training exercise that we were fortunate to take advantage of and put in a control line. Uh, that really was great help, but it also taught us uh, what it took to really make sure that we can get that control line in there, that Marshall would be able to put his fire hose down, uh, and then we'd be able to control uh, the burn. Uh, the other thing that we did as part of this that we Marshall had educated us on is just getting the land ready, right? This was just clearing some of the brush uh, along those control lines and putting it into the, the fire burn area. Uh, we were able to hire some local uh, vineyard workers to do that uh, on behalf of the landowners. Uh, we had one area where there was a series of PG&E poles uh, that we wanted to make sure that we cleared. So we cleared that as part of the process. Um, in some cases, we cleared around some redwood trees that we wanted to make sure uh, that the fire didn't run up against. Um, so these were the activities we did 
in advance. Um, and again, Marshall was great. Uh, after we did the clearing, he came back, he walked through and made sure, uh, frankly, that we did it right and that we were, we were good to go. Uh, and then on the post burn, you know, our job was primarily to watch the area for several days after the burn. Um, you know, for the first few days, uh, Fred and I <laughs> uh, and a few of the other owners would take three to four hour shifts, uh, just kind of traveling uh, up and down the road and looking at the area just to see if there's any hot spots. Um, the Marshall's team kept the fire lines uh, in place. So if there was some small areas, a stump that needed putting out, we were able to do that. Um, in one case, we actually, in one of the burns, uh, it flared up and uh, Marshall's team, you know, came out and put that out, you know, right away. And his team came out daily just to keep an eye on it. So keeping an eye on the activity after, um, you know, is really, you know, critical for us to do that. Ideally, you know, now that we've done these burns is we would go back in and some of the landowners are taking some of that dead debris, getting it clean, getting it on the ground. And whether we do some small pile burns as part of this, or quite frankly, go back next year and reburn the same areas uh, just to kind of clean it up. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I just want to, you know, really thank Marshall and Sasha's team and volunteers like Eric, um, who really educated us and, and brought us along. And then the incredible work they did along the way, um, you know, was just fantastic. And I'd say the good news now is, uh, <laughs> and poor Marshall is getting inundated. We, every neighbor is like, well, we want our land burnt. <laughs> Um, so again, I would just encourage you to say, take a strategic view, take a step back, look not just at your land, but how the, how it con is contiguous with other land that would make sense, take the initiative to bring the homeowners together, and then a plan can um, come together. So I'll, I'll pause there. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Wow. What a great, um, uh, just depth of information from your experience that you shared with everyone. Um, I, I can just see you, you really gave us information from the very beginning through the whole process and that is super um, helpful for people that are thinking about implementing this on their land. Um, so I, I, there's a couple of different directions we could go. We were at 545. We, we'd really like to finish by six. We know people are probably getting their suppers ready and have had a long day on Zoom already. So I want to respect people's time. Um, I do know that we do, there were some questions about CAL FIRE and uh, different types of um, vegetation management plans. Um, Marshall, did we want uh, Paul Fleckenstein? I think that he's here, or would you like to answer that question about the various um, VMP versus Paul, chime in if you want to talk, otherwise I could. Okay, I, uh, I put a video link in there and a website in the chat for folks to check it out, but it's Cal Fire Vegetation Management Program or VMP or Vegetation Treatment Program. And I'm just gonna kind of cater what I'm saying here to the questions. It is for private property, uh, not necessarily state property. So not the state forest, but private property. And it's CAL FIRES, in simple terms, CAL FIRES prescribed burning program. So CAL FIRE assumes all liability, completes envir full environmental review, um, and then carries out, carries out the prescribed burning. So that is, you know, on the, on the spectrum of it all from the very, on the other end of the spectrum is the private lender does everything themselves. This is, uh, I'm saying it's not a bad way because I'm with the government, but this is like full government doing everything. And um, my, my, la la uh, Last update on this is it's in no cost to the landowner, it's, but there's also a tremendous amount of demand for this and the capacity to the demand Cal Fire is still building capacity to accommodate more and more. So, uh, so Paul, you want to add? Can I um, add kind of a third window to that that's coming out soon? Um, so there's a, a brand new California State Certified Burn Boss program coming out. Um, which will be a, a brand new curriculum and certification that hasn't existed before. And it's based on Senate Bill S, SB 1260, um, which basically said that the state needed to create a certification for burn boss that was um, 
recognized by the state because the only one that had been used prior was the, the federal burn loss qualification, which wasn't officially recognized by the state. So um, there's a new curriculum, California State Certified Burn Boss, and per SB 1260, that uh, certification will have that burn boss acting as a contractor of the state which means that they will have liability support from the state uh, for leaving prescribed burns on private land. And it is a certification that is meant for and developed for non-agency folks in many cases, or, or may also be utilized by local fire districts as a way to lead prescribed burns with liability support um, from state backing. And there's also additional um, structure there where overall um, regarding the liability piece, California is a simple negligent state. So we fall right in the middle of kind of the three categories of the way liability is structured around prescribed burning, which is that you have to be shown negligent in order to be found liable. So if some crazy thing happens and you followed all of your burn plans, all of your permits, you did everything right, but something just goes wrong by chance, um, you can't be found liable, you're not negligent. Um, but what they're looking to do for this California State Certified Burn Boss, which is being proposed right now, and we'll see whether or not it goes through, is that that particular certification would come with a gross negligence category, so that if you're burning uh, through a burn boss who has gotten this state certification, um, now the liability structure is that, um, like, you pretty much can't be found liable. And that's based on the idea that in California, we are going to be living with fire no matter what. There are going to be wildfires that's inescapable. And so we need prescribed burning to be happening at a very broad pace and scale across the state. And unless we promote prescribed burning and remove some of that liability um, kind of barrier that's holding people back, we're not going to be able to get the good work done that we need to do because we're going to be too worried about wildfires when they're happening already and they're happening in really terrible dramatic ways um and so they're trying to kind of shift that um to make it more approachable and help us get more good work done on the ground great thank you thank you sounds great um so uh how are we doing on questions with um the chat i know that uh carrie um glockner um dropped a really nice um chunk of information for folks about the resource Cons conservation district and jason wells and how they may be as supportive of what folks are doing um i know sasha you've responded to a number of questions in the chat um we do yeah there are, there are a number of questions I got queued up and, and ones that came in before um, with the registrations, we, we should hit with some of the time that's left, I think. Okay, okay. We, um, I'm gonna drop in the chat for folks that are interested in looking at a video um, that um, Eric Dickey did um, during a prescribed burn. Um, I think it's really, really helpful if this is something you wanna learn more about or thinking about doing. Um, so I'll just drop that in the chat instead of us um, showing it. Go ahead, Bob. Um, Sherry, this one's for you. There was a question um, about are tribal leaders ever involved in controlled burns? Uh, yeah, you know, there's actually a group up in Yurok country that leads uh, training for controlled burns. And um, yeah, a number of tribes are involved in controlled burns on their own properties or work with um, often governmental agencies to help do that. Sometimes um, especially um, preservation conservation districts to help do it. Uh, Amon Mudson um, tribal band down Monterey way. I think they do quite a bit. Yeah, they, they do some great stuff. Um, and a lot of times some of the control burns that we're doing are actually targeted towards specific, um, resource plants, um, for basketry, for food, for medicine, various things. Great. Even um, locally, I'll just add to that too. We've been, we've been partnering with, um, various tribal members from around the, the North Bay area on a lot of our prescribed burns as well. Um, and, and working hand in hand with folks too. Great. Um, 
There was a question near and dear to my heart. Um, can prescribed burns be done in um, populated areas like Fitch Mountain or West Dry Creek? I'll take that one. I mean, the simple answer is is yes, we can. I mean, the very simple answer is we can do prescribed burns anywhere there's something to burn. <laughs> the real tricky part is the liability piece and what are the residents, uh, what's their risk or their liability that we're into it, willing to accept, including, you know, is there going to be increased erosion, smoke impacts, that type of thing. So in some ways, I kind of have an opinion that we should be doing more burning near homes because that's what we're trying to save during fires. And as we learn to live with fire, we can have, you know, large areas burned, but all the homes survive you know, and, and then no one gets hurt. So I think it's somewhat important. We do burning, do more burning near homes, but it's more what the, you know, back to that question about what, what is going to be accepted by the residents um, because that may be, that might surface as more of a hurdle than all the other, the three hurdles I talked about. So yes, it's possible. It can be tricky. And I would say that those would be the smaller scale burns of an acre or two, quarter acre, maybe a uh, very strategic, very small scale, very well planned out. So. Um, actually that segues into a question that was on the chat up at the top. Is there um, a, a space that's too small to do a prescribed burn on? For me, no. <laughs> so. I would love to do a prescribed burn on my 50 by 50 backyard. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, here's one, another one that I think uh, is pertinent to a lot of folks. It, will Mexican broom, or I'll add any kind of broom, French, Scotch, um, will they burn and will they be eradicated by a burn like this? So, a uh, broom has a fire adapted seed bank. So um, when you burn broom, whether in a wildfire or a prescribed burn, and, and there's some of this on the site that uh, Paul Pressler has as well this past fall. Um, what you're gonna do, you're gonna clear out all the standing broom and then you're gonna trigger a seed bank release, which is gonna be a carpet of broom seedlings that come in that next year. Um, it's, it looks really scary, but it's an incredible opportunity because you're flushing that entire seed bank all at once rather than leaving it to germinate over hundreds of years or 75 years or whatever it is, depending on which species you're talking about. Um, so then as long as you go back in that very next year and treat it again, either with a, a flamethrower in the middle of the wet winter or, um, or hand pulling or herbicide, whatever your, your passion is, um, or really within those first couple of years after that first treatment, um, you can actually knock out that entire seed bank and truly eradicate your problem or at least deal with a lot of it. Wow. We got to get Fitch Mountain, Marshall. Um, related question, um, are, what effect does, does fire have on, on mushrooms? Um, specific question uh, or follow on was they're not in a burn area from last year, they're not seeing the typical array of mushrooms coming back that they would normally expect this time of year. That might be a, a weather thing more than a fire, no fire thing. Um, often mushrooms actually really love coming back in the first couple of years after a fire. Um, but my understanding is that mushrooms also like a lot of water and we haven't had much right. this winter. Sherry, you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, question from uh, bef that came in before the session. Um, are there funding options and logistical support available for prescribed burns on state-owned lands? Yeah, so this is I'll, I'll I'll try to answer that one. So when I when I think about state-owned lands, I'm thinking about state parks, uh, state forests. So you know, state-owned lands, not to be confused with state responsibility area where Cal Fire has wildland fire jurisdiction. So um, state-owned lands are normally have some type of uh, management agency like state parks. So they they have processes they have to implement prescribed burning. So it's more kind of dependent upon them if they want to approach Cal Fire to do prescribed burning or they want to take it on themselves. Um, and, and there's obviously California Lands Commission agencies that don't necessarily have like a firefighting agency to implement prescribed burning. 
Um, so they, they would need to find how they want to achieve that or accomplish that. And it, it most likely would be in cooperation with another state agency, which is CAL FIRE. I do know in certain situations, if you're um, a neighbor to state parks, the, I don't know the technical term, but it's something like a good neighbor where they'll let you go on or to their to state parks property to do your defensible space. I know that's happened in both A over in Napa Valley. Um, I don't know if that's been reciprocated here in Sonoma County. So um, I would just say it's kind of a, another, it's a, it's a nuance to a neighbor to neighbor relationship with the state government, but you'd want to see, see what's available if, you're, if that's uh, the motivation behind that question. Got it. Um Priscilla, we're at six o'clock. There are a few more questions. I'm not sure how you want to handle. Yeah. Um, do people have a, a couple more minutes to just stay on? Um, we'll just go a couple minutes after. How many questions do you have? Um, three or four. Okay. Let's go for it real quick and then we'll wrap her up. Okay. Um, Marshall and Sasha probably says, does a prescribed burn have to completely decimate an area or is there a way to be con for the controlled burn to just clear the shrubs, dead wood and flammable material? Or is, that better or is that better managed by hand clearing and trimming? Yeah, um, I mean, this is the coolest thing about prescribed burning that, that I just get totally nerded out on because um, we actually have a pretty incredible amount of control over the way fire moves across the landscape, and that's by managing our ignitions, combining that with when we're burning, the, what the climate's done, what the weather is doing. But um, just by bringing fire down from the top rather than lighting from the bottom, we can really mitigate fire effects and, and have a short flame length, slow moving fire. Um, and the way I like to kind of help people envision that is if you light a match on a matchbox and hold it upright, it moves really slowly down the match toward your fingers and takes a long time to, for you to end up with a burn. But if you flip that match upside down, fire is going to rush up the match and burn your fingers. So we do the same thing on a landscape level when we're doing a broadcast burn in any kind of woodland or forest system where we work fire from the top down to the bottom so that we're getting nice mitigated fire effects that just clear out the understory and mostly are leaving the canopy intact. Fantastic. Um, this is a, um, another good one. Um, now that our 10 acre parcel has had its undergrowth completely burned out, I'm assuming this is in a recent um, burn area, um, is it possible to maintain this condition through planned burns on a rotating schedule? You want to do something? There, there was a similar question, I think, in the chat. Is that where you're reading it from, Pat? But it, uh, it, I, no, it wasn't. But go ahead. Okay. It, it, it somewhat depends. Um, you know, we're talking about fire burn. Every fire burns a little bit differently. So even the wall bridge, it wasn't a. It's not a. a I say binary event. It's not that it burned or didn't burn. So there's various levels of consumption. So in some spots, there, there's maybe nothing left to burn, like where it's grass or it burned the understore really thoroughly high intensity. Other areas, it, there may be an option, just like we saw with, with Paul Prester's prescribed burn areas where it'd be, in my recommendation, maybe great to go in and, and, and cut out all the dead dying, maybe the, the small Douglas firs in the oak woodland habitat. I looked at a property today that had that, you know, um, you know maybe to manage the understory, manage your ladder fuels. And in some ways, um, you know, I'm developing the opinion that it's kind of what fire would have naturally done historically, just cleans out the understory. So you're just kind of finishing what the wall bridge or whatever the, the, the wildfire did not do. So pile burning is an option. Chipping and mulching is another option perhaps. Um, but in some areas it won't support a prescribed burning for another three to five, maybe 10 years, depending on, on the vegetation response um, of, of that site. So a lot of that is soil dependent too, um, I would say. Sasha, you could probably add a lot more to that. No, I, I think that's right on. Usually we are finding in, in a lot of the woodland habitats, at least um, post wildfire, there's some rehab that needs to be done um, depending on how hot the fire burned through. Um, but mostly those, those woodland systems and those forest systems, you probably don't wanna go back in with another broadcast burn for like three to five years. You wanna give it a little rest, but during those three years of rest, you can be clearing the understory, just like Marshall said, doing pile burns so that you're preparing it for when you can go back in with the broadcast burn and then maintain it from there. Um, 
question do you do you plan burns with sensitivity to local wildlife marshall you want to take it <laughs> yes yes um at the highest level, we do not want to cause any any additional environmental damage of any kind um, with our prescribed burning. That being said, as I mentioned, just the mere fact of firefighters walking and everything else, we are in, you know we are causing erosion. So, any known environmental damage we are going to do, and and there you know we could talk about various varying levels of significance. We want to mitigate them, and if we can't mitigate them, and that's through that, that notice of exemption process and the full. EI environmental impact review report, if we can't mitigate, it, that might be reason alone not to conduct the prescribed burn. So an example being a habitat tree, a snag um, that has a known nest in it, we would do our, we would mitigate that by keeping fire away from that tree, uh, maybe not burning during that time of year where that nest could be used. Um, and so that's how we would, uh, an example of a mitigation, or we just not do not take the project on because we can't um, mitigate that, that um, environmental concern to the level that needs to be addressed. So it's kind of a gray area answer there, but ultimately we do not want to in, in, enhance or increase the environmental damage in our prescribed burning. And we could talk right. about water courses and, and other things as well, or destruction of habitat. Last question. Um, what local trainings are available? I'll see you uh, Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, okay. I, I was going to say the fire academy, but that probably won't make people happy. So go ahead. <laughs> I like that answer. Um, so yeah, Fire Forward is trying to help build capacity in the region by putting people through firefighter training um, and then offering additional courses to to broaden that knowledge and experience as well. Um, so if you do sign up on the Good Fire Alliance listserv, you can. Um, get notification of our next training opportunities that we put out. We have been really swamped by interest levels, so it, it might be hard to get everyone in, but you'll at least get notifications of those trainings. And regardless of those trainings, um, there are lots of opportunities to participate in the community and get out and help with pile burns. And um, some of those pile burns were even incorporating the basics of wildland firefighting and fire use so that people are getting that training experience, even if it's just a pile burn. So um, if you are interested in developing that skill set, I really do highly recommend getting involved in the Good Fire Alliance, and that'll give you kind of that more direct access to uh, both professional specific trainings and on the ground experience. And Fantastic. get involved in your local fire department. All right. I think that we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, as most of you saw, I launched a poll. We'd love to get your feedback on how helpful this was to you. Um, and also, um, we're thinking about doing a part B, which would be uh, Marshall taking us through some various scenarios um, and uh, for folks that are really interested in, in doing burns. So um, just let us know if that's of interest to you. Um, and uh, we will uh, try to make that happen. All right. Um, anything else um, that any of the speakers wanted to say before we say goodbye to everyone? If I can, I would just tag on that a lot of the stuff we presented was not like specific to an air quality district or a fire district. We tried to keep it pretty high level. So um, if you're serious about this, talk to your local agencies about those hurdles and how it all fits into place. Um, and then you kind of already heard come with some, kind of my, some of my bias that I think a lot more acres are going to be burned in a kind of prescribed burn association or neighbor helping neighbor building capacity, not involving government so much. And I think um, you know, whether you want me to say this or not or like this, that you know we need to be probably doing prescribed burning year round. Right now we're trying to cram it all into the winter or taking advantage of what's good weather-wise for firefighters. And and ultimately, I think it needs to be diversified across the whole whole calendar year. So um, that's a little bit of my opinion, but um, the folks that are here, you're kind of going to be the people that are kind of sharing some of this knowledge and. And, and running up against people that maybe don't support prescribed burning to the same extent we may do. And, and, and I'm also okay with differing opinions, um, but that's just kind of where 
to the scale we need to get to, 4 million acres, as was mentioned, is kind of what the low end of the average was for the state of California to burn. Um, we have a lot more homes down, a lot more impacts, um, and, and fire is one way until we find a surrogate, one way of, of preparing and being better prepared for the future and living with nature, so. Great, thank you for that, Marshall. And um, I just really want to thank all of our speakers. Thank you, Sherry, so much for being a part of this and for Sasha, Marshall, Paul, um, and uh, uh, to Craig, who's not here to hear his accolades, um, and also to Pat Abercrombie, who is very um, helpful in uh, managing our technology and our chat. It takes a village to do these, and I'm so glad that you are all here to learn and be a part of this. Again, if you want more of the same, let me know. I You could go to our Sonoma, Northern Sonoma County, uh, Coke Northern Sonoma County website and just send me an email. Um, so thank you all again for being here. Have a lovely evening and uh, we'll see you soon. Be safe.